So uh, hello, everybody. Uh, I'm Warren Hall. I'm the national manager of support services uh, for the American Liver Foundation. Uh, the American Liver Foundation is the nation's largest nonprofit serving people with liver disease, their families, their friends. We provide a voice and in a lot of cases an ear uh, for patients with liver disease and those who are involved with them. And we do this through education like we're doing here at this event, uh, support such as we do with our national helpline and in so many other ways uh, with research and advocacy. Uh, I wanna welcome you to this installment of our Ask the Expert series. Now we uh, developed this long running series because we heard and continue to hear uh, from so many people who say they either forgot to ask their doctor a question during their appointment or they realized on the way home that they didn't quite understand something but failed to or didn't have the time to be able to ask for clarification. And so because of that, we thought it would be helpful if we brought in uh, medical experts so that people can ask some of those questions uh, or get the help they need to understand some aspects of their disease uh, or of the, of the uh, treatment. Uh, now, our guest today is not our personal physician, uh, although many of us probably wish he was. Uh, so he may not be able to speak to your exact situation uh, or to tell you what to do, uh, because only your own healthcare team can do that. Uh, but hopefully all of us will get a better understanding of the complexities of, of PBC uh, in this next hour. Uh, during our meeting today, we encourage all of you to, uh, to write your questions in the chat box. Uh, you'll see that at the bottom of your screen. Um, we, say, we always say don't wait until the end uh, as uh, Dr. O'Reardon can answer these questions uh, throughout our time together. Some of you already submitted your questions when you registered and uh, we have those questions and we will be sure that we um, uh, bring them to the attention of the doctor as well. Uh, we ask that everybody, uh, if you would please keep yourself on mute so that uh, you know, there's no uh, sound interference so that we can all uh, hear the doctor uh, as well as we can. Now I would like to introduce Donna Bowles. Now, many of you already know Donna uh, for the great work that she does with our uh, PBC Facebook group, where she facilitates live and posted discussions. Um, she also hosts some in-person events, uh, which we hope we're gonna get back to uh, again very soon. If you're not a member of our PBC Facebook group, we encourage you to join. You can go to our website, uh, liverfoundation.org, uh, go to the PBC page and you'll see the link there. Okay, so now Donna, uh, I'm gonna turn this over to you. Thank you. I just wanna introduce uh, Dr. O'Riordan to everybody. Uh, Dr. O'Riordan is certainly no stranger to the ALF community as he serves on our National Medical Advisory Committee and he has made many presentations to us on a wide range of liver related topics such as viral hepatitis, fatty liver disease, and of course, PBC. His medical degrees are from institutions in Dublin, Ireland and Chicago, Illinois, where he is a member of Lakeshore Gastroenterology. Dr. O'Rourdon teaches various courses on hepatology at Lutheran General Hospital in Park Ridge, Illinois and has published many scholarly articles, the most recent of which includes topics such as IBS in gastroenterology testing technology. We are so pleased that Dr. O'Riordan is joining the ALF community once again for this presentation, which is part of our continuing Ask the Experts series. Thank you so much, Doctor, for joining us this evening. Donna Warren, thank you very much for the opportunity to talk with you this evening. Um, I've decided just to put together a couple of slides, maybe for about 15 or 20 minute presentation, just going over some of just the basic features of patients who suffer from primary biliary cholangitis. And hopefully this may answer a lot of questions that people have during the talk, but obviously at the end of the talk, I'm happy to answer any other questions that people may have. So just looking at the epidemiology of primary biliary cholangitis, this still remains a female predominant disease, although occasionally men do suffer from this condition. 
It's typically seen in people over the age of 40 years of age and does not present typically in childhood. Overall, the global estimation is that one in 1,000 women over the age of 40 are living with primary biliary cholangitis. And the estimated instance in Europe is one to two per 100,000 population per year, with a prevalence range of 1.9 to 40.2 per 100,000 of the population. And really what the problem is in primary biliary cholangitis is that bile is not effectively excreted from the liver and that causes subsequent lack of detoxification of certain substances in the system and also causes problems with digestive function. And primary biliary cholangitis really reflects the consequences of both immune-related and cellular injury to the cells that line the bile ducts, resulting in obstruction in the flow of bile. And over many years, this may progress into what's called some fibrosis and later on cirrhosis. So patients with primary biliary cholangitis can progress to end-stage liver disease. And the average survival many years ago in patients who were untreated was nine to 10 years after diagnosis. And this obviously is very different nowadays compared to what it was in the past. We have earlier diagnosis of patients and also we have treatment available, which has markedly lengthened the survival of patients with primary biliary cholangitis. There are multiple different symptoms which are very characteristic of primary biliary cholangitis and these do significantly affect patient's quality of life. There is pruritus or itching. A lot of patients suffer from dry eyes and dry mouth. Abdominal discomfort, typically in the right upper side of the abdomen. Fatigue, insomnia, some depression and Patients often complain of significant cognitive dysfunction. Jaundice is usually a late complication of consequences of cirrhosis. So it's important that lifelong care of patients is structured and individualized. And the goal is really to prevent end-stage complications of liver disease and to manage associated symptoms that patients may have that interfere with their daily quality of life. So when approaching somebody in the office who we see for evaluation of primary biliary cholangitis, it's very important to take a very detailed history and physical examination. Most patients at some stage will have an imaging test done of the liver, most commonly an ultrasound examination. Sometimes people will have a CT or even an MRI scan, although these are not typically needed unless there is concern about obstruction of the bile duct or another entity called primary bil or sclerosing cholangitis. And typically the diagnosis is made by performing blood tests called an anti-mitochondrial antibody that is present in over 90% of patients. And sometimes other autoimmune markers are looked at as well. Liver biopsy was the mainstay of, treat of diagnosis of primary biliary cholangitis in the past, although now liver biopsy does not need to be performed on every patient who has a diagnosis of primary biliary cholangitis. Typically the diagnosis made when someone presents to their primary care doctor with abnormal liver tests. So typically we are picking this up at a much earlier stage now than we did 10, 20, 30, 40 years ago. And the usual finding is that one of the liver enzymes that is secreted by the bile duct, the alkaline phosphatase is elevated. And then elevation of this prompts measurement of an anti-mitochondrial antibody. And if that is elevated at a reasonable titer, then this essentially gives you the diagnosis of primary biliary cholangitis. Liver biopsy typically is not required unless we're concerned about patients who may have coexistent autoimmune hepatitis or an overlap syndrome or patients who are worried about non-alcoholic steatohepatitis. In patients who have an anti-mitochondrial antibody that's reactive, but have liver tests that are completely within normal limits, it's very reasonable just to follow these patients on a yearly basis and consider further evaluation if the alkaline phosphatase level becomes elevated. 
Mm. Typically, biopsies performed on patients with normal liver enzymes and a positive antimicrobial antibody show minimal, if no, disease. So when we look at the different tests for primary biliary cholangitis, the alkaline phosphatase level is really the most important test that we see. It raises suspicion of the disease. It's helpful in the diagnosis, but also it's very helpful as we'll talk later in the prognosis of this disease. The liver enzymes, the AST, ALT, when elevated, raise concern about coexistent autoimmune hepatitis. Antibodies can be performed and typically the anti-mitochondrial antibody is performed that's helpful in the diagnosis, but doesn't really give a lot of prognostic information. And lower down the screen, we'll look at functions of the liver, such as the bilirubin, the platelet count, the INR or the albumin level. And these are tests that measure how well the liver is functioning. Those typically become abnormal in late stage disease or in patients with complications of cirrhosis. Typically in early stage disease, these measurements are usually completely within normal limits. However, in later stage disease, the bilirubin level, the platelets, the INR and the albumin are very important as they are very predictive of subsequent liver dysfunction. So this is often what we see when we do liver biopsies in patients with primary biliary cholangitis. This is what a normal bile duct looks like. And there's a lot of inflammation here, a lot of blue cells around the bile duct. This can progress where there's loss of the bile ducts and loss of the inflammatory reaction. Sometimes the inflammation spreads into the center of the liver and a consequence of all these first three conditions ends up in forming nodules in the liver or what's known as cirrhosis. So what's very important in primary biliary cholangitis is deciding which patients are going to run into complications in the future. We want to look at what the risk of liver related complications are and what the risk of death from liver disease or other diseases are. So all patients really should be evaluated for what their risk is of developing progressive disease. And what's important with this is that then we can decide about the potential for standard treatments or newer treatments that are available. And we can divide people into high and low risk disease patients, typically by evaluating what their response is to the first line therapy of urso deoxycholic acid or Actigol. The greatest risk of complications can be identified by sometimes age, sex of the patient, and how advanced their liver disease is at initial presentation, and whether they respond well to treatment or not. So it's important to recognize that the patients at the greatest risk of complications from PPC have, typically have an inadequate biochemical response to treatment and also have underlying cirrhosis. The strongest risk factors for a lack of response to treatment are early age of diagnosis and advanced stage of liver disease at presentation. It's important when we see patients with primary biliary cholangitis to assess their stage of disease. And that can be done either by blood tests or now we are using much more non-invasive tests such as MR elastography, fibro scan, or also serological markers, looking at markers of inflammation and fibrosis. So these now have become standard in following patients with primary biliary cholangitis. In the old days, we used to do serial liver biopsies to look for evidence of progressive disease. There are various different risk scores that we can look at called the GLOBE score and the PBC UK score, which help define patients who are most at risk of developing complications from their primary biliary cholangitis. So, Looking at people with primary biliary cholangitis, there are several different things that are involved in initial assessment of patients and also in following patients in the future. First of all, it's important to stratify what their risk is and to empirically treat if they are candidates for treatment. And typically, most patients will start on urso deoxycholic acid at a dose of 13 to 15 milligrams per kilogram per day. 
And usually we will follow their liver enzymes after six months and a year and see which patients are responding to therapy. Patients who respond to ERSO deoxycholic acid typically have a less complicated disease in the future and follow-up should just be with their primary care or liver specialist with yearly or every six month monitoring of their liver enzymes and periodic measurement of liver stiffness and fibrosis with fibroscan, which has now become standard. In patients who don't respond to ursodeoxycholic acid, sometimes we're concerned about features of autoimmune hepatitis, and we will consider addition of second line therapies such as a beta-cholic acid or some newer treatments are becoming available. It's important to know what the disease stage is because that really affects prognosis in people with this condition. So in patients who have scar tissue or cirrhosis, it's recommended to screen those patients for esophageal varices with an upper gastrointestinal endoscopy, which is a straightforward procedure done on an outpatient basis that takes about 20 minutes. If patients have complications of cirrhosis, such as an elevated bilirubin or ascites or hepatic encephalopathy, then they would need to be referred to a transplant center for evaluation for liver transplantation. And then the third aspect of the disease really is to manage these symptoms actively. So those complications we talked about, like pruritus or itching, fatigue, and as well as osteopenia, osteoporosis. And if those symptoms cannot be managed by the primary care doctor or by the gastroenterologist referral to a hepatologist or liver transplant center would be appropriate. So there are different ways of defining response to treatment. There are what are called static measures, which are just looking at blood tests, which primarily the alkaline phosphatase level or the GGTP level to assess whether people are responding to treatment. Are there are more continuous scoring where we follow patients over many years following their bilirubin, alkaline phosphatase level and liver enzymes, their albumin, platelets, and we can develop scores as to how patients are responding to treatment and what their chances of progression in the future. So probably the most important thing is probably, you know, the prognostic tools. And the most helpful thing is probably how patients respond to treatment with their alkaline phosphatase level. And if their bilirubin level is elevated, how that responds to treatment. It's also, like we said, very important to know their baseline stage of disease. So these are very important two entities which are important. Other or tests which we do are, have some benefit, but are probably not as important as the first two that I mentioned. So the whole goal of treatment is to slow progression of the disease. And we do have good data that treating patients with primary biliary cholangitis with medications in those patients who do respond to treatment, there is significant slowing of the disease. The drugs that are presently approved for this condition are urso deoxycholic acid and obetic cholic acid, which have been approved. But there's a significant difference in treatment response to these medications as patients in clinical trials have been at various different stages of disease. So that needs to be taken into consideration when starting one or adding a second medication. Typically, our so deoxycholic acid is used as first line pharmacotherapy and is usually continued for life. Typically, we give patients or so deoxycholic acid on a twice daily basis. And it's been shown that patients whose alkaline phosphatase level doesn't decrease significantly or remains greater than 1.67 times the upper limit of normal, those patients and those patients with an elevated bilirubin are patients who will benefit from addition of other medications. And the medication that's been released over the last number of years for those patients, a drug called obetic cholic acid, which is helpful in preventing progression of liver disease. This is a drug that has some side effects, the major side effect being pruritus or itching. So it's important to start this medication on a low dose and gradually titrate the dose up, up to 10 or 20 milligrams. If you start too high, most patients find this very difficult to tolerate. 
There are some other medications that have been used, such as budesonide or benzofibrate, which have been used with ursodiocholic acid, which are not standard of care, but do have some good promising data in some new clinical trials. So what's important in the management? Well, I think for a lot of people, they're trying to figure out who should they see? Should they see their primary doctor? Should they see a gastroenterologist? Should they see a hepatologist? I think once the diagnosis has been made, you know, most gastroenterologists will manage patients with primary biliary cholangitis. If patients want a, another opinion, they can certainly see a hepatologist and it depends on the comfort level of the doctor, you know, who you're seeing and how many patients he has in his practice with this condition. Most primary care doctors will have very, very few patients with this in their practice. Gastroenterologists will have a handful of patients with this condition. Obviously, hepatologists will have a lot of patients with this condition in their practice. Frequently, your doctors will send you to other specialists depending on the type of symptoms. So often you'll go to see a dermatologist because of bad skin itching problems, sometimes an ophthalmologist because of bad eye problems. So I would rely on your primary care doctor to send you to those other specialists if needed. How often should you do testing and follow up? It all depends really on the stage of the liver disease. If there's early stage and mild disease, less frequent testing is needed and probably blood tests every six to 12 months would probably suffice. If there's more severe liver disease and complications of cirrhosis with jaundice or ascites or confusion, more frequent testing is needed. We generally do recommend patients to be on just a healthy diet. Typically a low salt diet is probably the best to try and prevent any worsening of ascites or swelling in the ankles. Um, people are very interested in various different over-the-counter supplements and various different herbal remedies. And generally most of these are safe. There is some data with SAME and milk thistle or silomarin patients with fatty liver disease and alcoholic liver disease, less with primary biliary cholangitis, but these are probably safe medications to take. I think you need to be careful with certain herbal remedies to make sure that there's no liver toxicity associated with these. Alcohol is always a big issue in people with liver disease and certainly mild alcohol intake which obviously depends if you're Irish or not, but mild alcohol intake would be considered okay, but typically moderate or heavy alcohol intake is not recommended in people with liver disease. It's been found that caffeine, two or three cups of coffee a day, has been found to be protective against progression of a lot of underlying liver diseases. So mild or moderate caffeine intake is perfectly safe. I think you need to be careful with the use of over-the-counter medications um, Tylenol is very safe in low doses, but typically more than four extra strength Tylenol per day is not considered to be safe in people with underlying liver disease. With anti-inflammatories such as Motrin, Aleve, Ibuprofen, these medications you know, should be avoided in people with liver disease because of the risk of stomach upset, intestinal bleeding, and also a risk of kidney injury in people taking these medications. So certain special settings such as pregnancy. So some women who are diagnosed with primary biliary cholangitis are of reproductive age. Ursodeoxycholic acid is safe during conception, pregnancy and postpartum. So it is safe for people with primary biliary cholangitis to become pregnant. There are some complications that can occur in pregnancy, so it's very important to follow up with someone who is familiar with the treatment of PVC patients in pregnancy. One of the things to notice is that if, or know is that if you have cirrhosis with PVC, there is definitely a higher maternal and fetal complication rate once you have evidence of cirrhosis, but not in patients with milder liver disease. There are some patients who do not respond to typical treatment with Actigol or ursodeoxycholic acid and may have some features of autoimmune hepatitis or an overlap syndrome. And these patients really need to be diagnosed with a liver biopsy to assess what the degree of inflammation is from autoimmune hepatitis and whether they need extra treatment for that, such as 
with various different steroids or immunosuppressive medications. So some of the symptoms that we try and manage in patients with primary biliary conjunctitis are often very difficult to manage. And certainly itching is one of the most difficult conditions to manage. And typically, if it's very severe, often may indicate uh, an aggressive type of PVC. Some of those patients do not do well if they have progressive PVC and should be seen at a transplant center. There are medications we can use for pruritus, cholestyramine or is a bile acid resin <clears throat> that works quite well as first line treatment. And there are other treatments such as rifampin, hydroxazine has been used in some patients or atorax. There's been some data, limited data on the use of Zofran, which is an anti-nausea medicine, some antidepressant medications and some medications such as naltrexone, which are opiate antagonists that actually do relieve itching in a lot of patients. I think fatigue is particularly difficult to manage because it may be multifactorial and certainly the disease itself does cause significant fatigue in a lot of patients. And this is obviously hard. You want to give good advice about sleep education and controlling stressors as much as possible. There is some data using a stimulant called ProVigil in some patients. We've had some success with that. Although sometimes insurance companies do give you a hard time in prescribing this medication for this condition. The sick complex is a condition where people get dry eyes and dry mouth, and this often is difficult to manage. So if, with tear supplements and other oral supplements, you, if this does not work, certainly referral to an ophthalmologist may be very helpful. And certainly if patients are having other complicated side effects, referral to a specialist to manage these symptoms is advisable. So osteoporosis is a very compl common complication in patients with PPC. So it's important to evaluate all patients for the risk of osteoporosis. So in patients who are postmenopausal, should be getting a bone density scan done anyway, but people who are premenopausal, you should also do a bone density scan to look for loss of bone mineral density and advise patients to supplement with both calcium and vitamin D as long as there are no contraindications to either of these medications. There are other medications for osteoporosis, such as Fosamax and Actonel, which have been used for about 20 years. And these are thought to be safe in patients with primary biliary cholangitis. Sometimes people can have problems with absorbing vitamins in advanced PVC. So it's important to supplement those patients with added vitamins. And those fat soluble vitamins are vitamin A, vitamin D, vitamin E, and vitamin K. We frequently see that patients with cholestatic liver disease or PBC have elevation in their serum lipids. These typically are not found to be atherogenic, so there's no real significant increase in coronary mortality with the elevation in these lipids, but if it's decided to treat these lipid elevations, the lipid-lowering drugs that we commonly use for heart disease have been found to be safe in patients with PBC. If PBC progresses to develop cirrhosis, it's very important to screen patients for what's called portal hypertension or esophageal varices. So those patients should undergo an endoscopy and probably have that repeated every two or three years, depending on the findings of the initial endoscopy. And the presence of cirrhosis itself is a risk factor for liver cancer, which is one of the commonest complications of liver disease and one of the most frequent indications for liver transplantation at the moment. So patients need to be screened with ultrasound examinations of the liver typically every six months. We used to be doing liver transplantation much more commonly for patients with PBC and this has become much less common over the last 20 years, mainly because of better medications we have to treat PBC, but the prevalence of PBC is increasing. If patients are treated with liver transplantation, the survival rate is excellent compared to multiple other indications for liver transplantation. 
So the five-year survival is almost 85%, which is excellent. Um, certainly, PBC can recur post-liver transplants, so those patients can be treated with ursodeoxycholic acid, and that's been found to be safe post-transplant. So I was going to leave it at that and open the floor to any questions or any issues that people want to discuss. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, so much good information. Ken, are you going to just ask, post questions or? I'm happy to. Um, are there questions post? I don't see any questions or are they? In the chat. Just oh, in the chat. Okay. The chat. Uh -huh. um, so um, why is PBC increasing worldwide is an interesting question. Um, the real issue is, is this really increasing worldwide or are we just more aware of the condition and are we better at diagnosing it? So I think it's probably a combination of this. There may be a slight increase in the disease that's occurring worldwide in certain areas of the world, but I think it's also because primary care people understand this disease and our testing is much better than it used to be. So I think it's probably increased awareness and as well as increased testing. So uh, I have a question that came in through the uh, helpline. Uh, this person said, I'm 58 and last September uh, I was diagnosed with PBC. A few months ago, my son who was 29 was diagnosed with MS. Does one have something to do with the other? I mean, certainly there's a genetic this disposition for in PBC. So there are about five to 10% of people with PBC whose family members may have a positive anti-mitochondrial antibody may develop PBC. There's certainly an overlap at various different autoimmune diseases that can occur in people. So we see an increased instance of thyroid diseases, celiac disease, diabetes, and certainly, you know, MS, all these diseases, you know, can be associated as other mutations in the immune system of the body. So there's not a direct association, but certainly families who do have a higher instance of immune related diseases will be more likely to develop these conditions. Mm. Okay. And so I see another question in the chat there. Um, do you consider having severe uh, pruritus uh, pre-diagnosis, but controlled with medication and now with diagnosis still indicating advanced stage? I mean, there are certainly non-invasive ways of looking for advanced stage of disease. I mean, it can indicate advanced disease, not in everybody. There are a lot of reasons for people having itching, but certainly you're always concerned in people with progressive pruritus that their disease may be advancing. So certainly you could do non-invasive tests if the lab tests are not showing any difference. You could do elastography or MR elast you know, and elastography. Both of those tests are very helpful. Mm -hmm. um, okay. I'm looking at some of the other questions here about people with enlarged spleens. And I think the the association of large spleens is usually a consequence of people who have portal hypertension or cirrhosis you know, of the liver. Um, not always cirrhosis, but mostly cirrhosis. And when the spleen becomes enlarged, it chews up certain cell groups. So the hemoglobin is often low, which makes people anemic. The white cell count can become low. Um, and also the platelet count can become low. So all of those may increase risk of infection. They also may increase bleeding risk in patients with PBC. So certainly this is a consequence of you know, advanced fibrosis or cirrhosis from PBC. Typically in very early PBC, we do not see an enlarged spleen. So I think you, that probably is less likely. You would look for another reason for those counts being low if there was very mild disease. Mm -hmm. There's a question there about uh, at what point do you feel most people need to be referred to a transplant center if they're non-responsive to URSO, doctor? Do you have any I thoughts mean, on that? I think it depends on 
who they're seeing for their, you know, PBC, if they're seeing, you know, GI doctor or liver specialist who's not at a transplant center who has a lot of experience, they don't need to go to a transplant center. The main reason to go to a transplant center, I think, is if they're not responding to typical medication, either ursodeoxycholic acid with or without obedicolic acid or some newer medications, or if they develop complications of cirrhosis. So if they become jaundiced or yellow, or if they develop esophageal varices, or if they develop ascites or hepatic encephalopathy, then those patients should obviously be seen at a transplant center. But not every patient needs to be seen at a transplant center. But I think it also depends who you're seeing. If you see someone with a lot of experience, they can always send you to a transplant center. If you're seeing somebody who doesn't have very many patients with PVC, you may just feel more comfortable going to a transplant center where they see a lot of patients. I mean, just because you go to a transplant center doesn't mean you need a transplant. It just means you may be seeing a specialist who sees a lot of patients with that condition. Correct, right. Thank you. Yeah. I, I have a personal question. I just want to confirm that you said mild alcohol use, but only if you're Irish. Uh, am, am I quoting you correctly on that? Well, the definition of mild alcohol use varies depending on nationality, of course. <laughs> Uh, okay. Um, but along those lines, we did get a question um, that someone had asked, um, can a person with PBC, are there any findings about the use of marijuana uh, for PBC or for any liver diseases at this point in time? You know, so it's interesting that a lot of patients, we don't recommend smoking for just their general health. And uh, there may not necessarily be any worsening of liver disease, but certainly marijuana use is beneficial in a lot of studies for people with liver disease. Certainly itching may improve with the use of marijuana. So certainly we don't tell people not to smoke marijuana. I think we need to be careful just with continual use of marijuana can cause a lot of gastrointestinal complaints. So I think, you know, periodic use of marijuana, I don't think is contraindicated in people with liver disease. I think like every, like everything else, just careful use mm -hmm. is good. So we, we talked about staging quite a bit and that comes up fairly common in my support group, um, doctor. So if you have liver enzymes that are not necessarily in a normal range, but seem to be responding or not responding to the use of Urso, those enzymes can be diagnostic in telling you what stage you're in without a liver biopsy, is that correct? No, no, I don't, I don't think the liver enzymes tell you what stage of the disease is present. There's really no correlation with the liver enzymes in the stage of disease. The liver enzymes are really just markers of inflammation. So if we're looking for stage of disease, I think liver biopsy is the gold standard. And okay. nowadays, nowadays we have better non-invasive tests such as elastography or fibroscan or liver fibrosis markers. So those are probably better, you know, if you're looking for stage of disease. You know, the liver enzymes do not predict stage of disease. Okay. The liver enzyme, the alkaline phosphatase, if it doesn't respond, may suggest that there's a, a greater risk of progression of the disease, but doesn't tell you what the stage of the disease is. Okay, thank you. Uh, doctor, could you say a few words uh, about COVID, the COVID vaccine, uh, in relation to those who have uh, PBC? And I think if you look at the data now that's been published, you know, in patients with chronic liver disease, as well as with liver transplantation, it's found that the COVID vaccine is extremely safe in these patients. So really, there's no reason for patients not to get vaccinated for COVID. I mean, the last thing you want in someone with advanced liver disease is a superimposed viral infection. So we do recommend all our patients to be vaccinated for COVID. As we do, we recommend them to be vaccinated for influenza. And if they've enlarged spleen, they probably should get a pneumococcal vaccine. So we do recommend normal vaccination and COVID is no different to this. Mm -hmm. So in talking about AMAs, um, Doctor, can you go from a positive to a negative or vice versa? And if someone has a positive AMA, but their liver enzymes are within normal limits, you just follow those patients with serial enzymes. There's no need for a biopsy. So there's multiple different questions there. Um, okay. So it's like three or four separate questions. I think first is, 
you know, can we follow AMA? So some people have followed the titer of AMAs and often it does decrease with treatment. Um, it typically doesn't become negative, but it may improve with treatment. It's not necessarily that helpful prognostically. So we don't do serial measurements of AMA. Um, another question is, you know, if the AMA is positive and the liver enzymes are normal, in the old days, we used to biopsy all these patients and we found that nearly everyone had very mild or minimal disease. So now the recommendation is really just to follow the liver enzymes and the alkaline phosphatase. And when that becomes elevated, then look at, to figure out what stage their disease is. So you can do, you know, fibro scan or even consider doing a liver biopsy once the liver tests become elevated. Okay. Thank you. And I have one more question from my uh, end, and that was, um, you, you already explained uh, PBC, and you did say a few words about PSC. Uh, the question was, uh, is it common to have both, or, or do people have both? I mean, it's unusual to have both PBC and PSC together. That's very unusual. There are certain overlap syndromes with autoimmune liver disease as a complication of PBC and PSC. But typically, you do not have PSC and PBC together. Okay. And I'm just looking at some of the questions in the chat here. And one of them was the discrepancy between doctors on whether fiber scan is accurate or not. I think it's a very important issue. Certainly, we most data we have on fiber scan is really in people with hepatitis C and people with fatty liver disease. It's often inaccurate and in very obese people with fatty liver disease we do not have a lot of data on people with PBC. So there is a definite discrepancy, you know, between doctors, I agree, and fibro scan. I think what's important is serial fibro scan. So not the individual measurement, but if you follow it yearly over a couple of years, it's very helpful to look for progression of disease. Mm -hmm. And there's a question here about would having Crohn's disease and PBC present someone from qualifying for liver transplant? No. So at what point on one of these questions, somebody wanted to know at what point should they have their first endoscopy just for a baseline or is it when they become more advanced disease? Yes, there's no need really to do an endoscopy on people with early PBC, but when they certainly develop cirrhosis or advanced fibrosis, then it is recommended to do an endoscopy to screen them. If it's noted that the platelets are low on initial lab testing or follow-up testing, and certainly when the platelets get less than 150,000 or 100,000, you know, it's another reason to do an endoscopy. Or if patients develop a complication such as jaundice or they develop ascites, those patients also should get an endoscopy. So what do you recommend for people who have G oh, a great deal of GI issues? Should they see a gastroenterologist or do you feel like they need to just stay with the care of their hepatologist? I think, you know, like I was saying earlier, I think it depends on just the comfort level. You know, a lot of the hepatologists in the university center don't see any people with gastrointestinal disorders. Some of the people in the community see both people with GI and liver disorders. So I think it just depends on the comfort level of who you're seeing. Okay. Um, any other questions by anybody that's actually online? Is there anything else, Warren, that you wanted to have Dr. Cover this evening? Uh, I think that's it. I, I think um, I think we, we covered a lot of good things, a lot of good information, covered a lot of the questions. And I think in your presentation, you did as well, covered a lot of the information people were right. curious about. Right. Can you maybe just, can you say more um, about diet? Um, because I, I know, um, you know, there's questions. Uh, you did mention, obviously, low salt. Um, you know, some people are asking about low well, is keto uh, a, a diet to follow it, and we do get this with in regard to cirrhosis and many other liver diseases as well. Mm -hmm. um, so, what what would your thoughts be? Um, because we know, I, I guess, um, the the knowledge of diet might vary from doctor to doctor. Um, mm -hmm. You know, we always recommend people consult a certified you know dietitian. But um, any uh, maybe a little more detail about 
people with diet like is is losing weight a, a requirement you know for dealing with this or does it depend on the person or um you know any anything a little bit more about diet because we do get a lot of those questions mm -hmm. i think some sort of basic things with diet certainly people if their weight is up and they may have it you know elevated cholesterol or some glucose intolerance or diabetes those people are at high risk of developing fatty liver disease which could also exacerbate liver disease if you already have PBC. So I think, you know, maintaining a reasonably ideal body weight is the ideal for most people in the United States, but obviously it's difficult, especially during COVID times. Um, and I think just a healthy diet, I mean, we typically talk about this Mediterranean diet has been sort of a healthy diet. I personally would just like to eat the diet while on the Mediterranean rather than having a Mediterranean <laughs> diet in the US. I think that would be preferable. Um, I think just generally being healthy, I think that's really the key. I mean, I think extreme diets, you know, they're obviously a good way to lose weight. But if you look long term at people who go on these incredibly extreme diets, when you follow people out five to 10 years later, 90% of people are back to the weight they've lost. So you really have to do something I think that's healthy, mm -hmm. that you enjoy, a little bit of yeah. exercise, I think is good. And just try and eat a healthy diet. And that I think means trying to cut out the carbohydrates as much as possible, cutting out the fat as much as possible, and then just being careful with your salt. So I think small portions and just eating healthy, there's no better advice. That's the best thing you can do. Do you feel people with liver disease need to avoid processed foods or red meat? Several of my members have a real problem, uh, think, and they feel like it's possibly just adding to the disease process. Do you have any thoughts on that? I think certainly in people with advanced liver disease, I think you need to be very careful with a large intake of meat, but certainly there's a concern about the protein intake and the risk of hepatic encephalopathy getting worse. I think in milder liver disease, I think it's really on a personal level, whatever you feel makes you more energetic and gives mm -hmm. you better nutrition, I think it, there's no real recommendation. Okay. Um, I'm looking at the questions here. So joint pain, is there anything that you feel besides NSAIDs or over-the-counter Tylenol products that someone or that you recommend to your patients for the joint pain? I know that's a big problem for many of my members in the support group. I mean, we definitely recommend Tylenol in low dose for joint pain. We tell people to avoid NSAIDs because those are bad drugs, typically in people with liver disease, so you need to be very careful with use of those. Um, there are other things with calcium, vitamin D, and there are other sort of pain medications or other anti-inflammatories that you can use that don't have intestinal side effects, so you can just talk with your primary care, or that's when it's worth going to see a rheumatologist and talk to them about the different options that are available. So I think seeing various different subspecialists, I think is very important in people with, you know, PVC. Okay. Mm. I think when people do that, though, sometimes that, that's many times the specialists are hesitant to prescribe something because there's liver disease involved. And I think that's a common thing that many members run up against. And I think it's just a matter of, you know, the liver specialist and the rheumatologist or dermatologist or ophthalmologist, just a matter of communication. So that's yeah, really, really, I mean, that's really, I think, all it is. It's, you, know, you need to I mean every medication you take is detoxified in your liver, no matter what you take. Right. So it's just a matter of which drugs are at higher risk of causing problems, which drugs are at lower risk. So it's really just a matter of the specialist communicating. And this day and age with electronic medical records, this is so much easier than it used to be. Correct. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Well, thank you uh, certainly to all those who have joined us uh, here for this presentation. Uh, this uh, has been recorded, and so we will be posting it on our uh, various communication pages, including our YouTube channel. So, you know, so many people uh, will be able to uh, tune into this and see the recording. And you know, for everybody who's here, if it, you uh, 
know anybody else for whom this information could be helpful, please uh, be sure to invite them to our page. It'll probably be posted in about two days or so. Um, and as I said at the beginning, I, I think we can reaffirm this now that all of us probably do wish that uh, Dr. Reardon was our doctor. Um, however, you have imparted uh, you know, some really good information to all of us. And uh, sure. we, certainly, uh, we certainly appreciate uh, you being with us to do that. And you know, hopefully we'll, we'll be able to have you back again uh, for another topic for the, the Liver Foundation. Um, mm -hmm. and, and finally, I want to uh, just give a shout out to Donna Bull, who, uh, as I mentioned, and she mentioned a few times about the, the <laughs> PBC Facebook group that has been going strong for such a long time. You know, we do get a number of uh, inquiries from people who ask about PBC support groups. And although there's very few, there, unfortunately, there's very few in-person support groups for liver disease as it is, uh, even rare uh, to have a support group for, for PBC. And so that's why we, we direct everybody uh, to this group. And so for those who are here and those who will be listening to the recording of this, if you haven't uh, are not a member of the group, um, you know, we certainly encourage you uh, to do that where um, you can interact with others and share ideas and experiences, uh, all facilitated uh, by Donna and the great uh, compassion and, uh, and, and interest that she has for the folks. So Donna, well, I, I just want to say a, a word of thanks to you as well. Oh, it's my pleasure. Great. My pleasure. It's a wonderful group of people. Wonderful group. Yeah. yeah. Great. Okay, well, everybody, we wish you uh, a good rest of the day and uh, please follow our uh, liverfoundation.org where you can see uh, information about uh, any upcoming uh, webinars that we have about uh, liver disease. So once again, doctor, thank you very much. Donna, thank, thank you. you. And thank you to everybody who's joined us. Mm -hmm. Thank you.